and we are live. Alan. Welcome. I am Alan Benson with the African American Initiative, known as AAI. We are pleased to originate and co-host this legislative summit during the 2022 legislative wrap-up. As many of you all know, AAI is a policy initiative organized in 2010, featuring a wide array of primarily African-American stakeholders, leaders, and operatives that come together to discuss and address the issues they confront the African-American community. The legislature meets every year on the first Tuesday after the first Monday of each January to consider new laws or revisions to laws that have significant impact on the people of the Commonwealth. While most often there are agreements, there are many areas where there is disagreement. This summit will give you unique insights from lawmakers as to where we stand as the legislative process comes to a close. Now, we are pleased to co-host this event with the Louisville Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and Cy Boulay of Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity. We are also pleased that we are continuing our collaboration with AARP of Kentucky and WLOU Radio, who is simulcasting this event at 1350 on your dial and streaming on Facebook Live. This event will later be posted on YouTube. Now, AAI wants to give special recognition to the National Black Caucus of State Legislators for their continuing work on the front lines of our nation's capitals, fighting for truth, justice, and equality. At this time, we will hear from the president of the Louisville Alumni Chapter, Ms. Rosalind Ross Welsh. Thank you. Hello, all, and we are so excited that you could join us this evening for this phenomenal summit. My name is Rosalind Welch, and I am the president of the Louisville Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. I am pleased to co-sponsor this important legislative summit with AAI. Delta Sigma Theta Sorority was founded in 1913 on the campus of Howard University to promote academic excellence, to provide support for the underserved, and to educate and stimulate participation in the establishment of positive public policy. And that's why we're here tonight. Social action is uh, the foundational principle of our sorority. And to that end, we engage with legislatures locally, on the state level and the federal level to advocate for policies that will benefit people of color, particularly those in historically underserved communities. We follow the actions of state legislature and work with our partner organizations to advocate for change where needed. We are pleased to be key members of the legis we are pleased that key members of the legislature are here today to share with us and we look forward to hearing so much from you and to learn from this discussion. Thank you so much for having this. We will now hear from our moderator, State Senator Gerald Neal of the 33rd District of Kentucky. Thank you. You're muted. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, uh, listeners for and viewers uh, from, uh, for viewing and coming in to join us uh, with respect to the AAI Summit 2022 legislative wrap up. Uh, I'm delighted to have uh, individuals that I've worked with over the years. They have great insights into the subject matter that we will get into today uh, to join us and to share these insights with you. Uh, the Kentucky General Assembly goes back for the last two days of the 2022 regular session, April 13th and 14th. So once again, there's a mixed bag of policy and we always have this every time we come together and some notable opportunities were actually missed. We did some good things, we did some things not so good. We refer to it as the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I'm very delighted to have my friends joining me here today. And first of all, what I wanna do is introduce these individuals. First, we have the Senate Democratic floor leader, uh, Senator Morgan McGarvey. Uh, he represents District 19 here in Louisville. Secondly, we have Representative Joni Jenkins. She's a House, Dem House Democratic floor leader, and she represents District 44 here in Louisville. Additionally, we have my good friend, Senator Reginald Thomas, Senate Democratic Caucus leader. His district is 13, and that's in Lexington, Kentucky. 
And we have also my good friend, Representative District Graham, uh, Derek Graham. He's House Democratic Caucus leader, and he represents the 57th District in Frankfort, Kentucky. And of course, we have Representative Pamela Stevenson, who represents District 43 here in Louisville, and Representative Katura Heron, who represents District 42. So we have a full house here today, and we are delighted to have you and to have them because we have a lot to talk about. We have a lot to talk about. But before we go there, I'm going to start with uh, uh, Senator, uh, Senator Morgan McGarvey to give us sort of insight as to how this thing uh, that we call a legislative session has impacted him. And I'm going to ask each of our guests to go right down the road to get a sense of what they feel about what we just went through and as we wrap up. Senator McGarvey. Thank you, Senator Neal. I uh, appreciate the introduction, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Wow, uh, this is what we call the long session. Uh, the reason we call it the long session is because this is when we do the budget. The budget is the state's ultimate policy document. It's our moral document. But this session had more to it than that. Um, this session started with the once in every 10 year process of redistricting. Uh, I think that set the tone for the session. and. I'll, I'm going to talk about some of the good things we did, but I have to say my overall impression of the session, it was a missed opportunity, starting with redistricting. Redistricting was an opportunity for people to come together, to finally get rid of the partisan gerrymandering that's been going on in Frankfurt for so long and allow for a nonpartisan redistricting commission to draw fair maps. Instead, two of the three maps that were drawn are under court challenge right now. Uh, and I think there's a much more transparent way we could have done that. I mean, people think redistricting is technical government stuff but it's not. This is how we are represented in our government. Uh, it's actually the, the part of the foundation of how every session for the next 10 years is gonna go. Didn't start off on a good note. I think it was a missed opportunity. You know, then we get into the budget. This is a budget year. Again, this is, this is the big one. We can talk about our values all we want to, anywhere we, anywhere we want to, but unless we put our funds behind it, then a lot of times it's just words. This was a once in a generation opportunity for us. We have a $2 billion surplus in this budget. We have a projected $2 billion surplus in the next budget. We have $5 billion in federal infrastructure funds. We have $1.3 billion in American Rescue Plan Act funds, right? This was the time that we could have left our mark. This was the session where we could have said, you know what? People might not remember exactly what we did here this year, but 20, 25 years from now, they're saying that's when Simmons College really started to grow. That's when we had universal pre-K. That's how we lured this company here, right? Now, if I'm going to sum that up, if I'm going to sum that, sum that up, Senator McGarvey, yes. I would call it missed opportunity. Missed opportunity. Yeah. And, and so we did some good things. You know, social workers got raises. Um, we had some, some more spending in education. But, you know, I look at this, Senator Neal, as this was the session we could have talked about what can government do to help people. And we spent most of the time talking about what it can't do. So what I want to thank... teach kids in school, what, you know, what, what kids can't play sports, what people can't get nutrition assistance. Well, folks, we, we just heard it strongly from the Senate side. I'm going to go over to the House side and the House leadership and ask Representative. Um, Joni Jenkins, Leader Jenkins, what impressed you or what struck you about this session, this long session that we just went through and only have two more days left? Thank you. Thank you, Senator Neal. Thank you for the invitation to be with all of you tonight to talk about uh, the important things that state government is doing that impacts everyone's life. And I would just say ditto, ditto to what Leader McGarvey said. We started out with redistricting and uh, the, the House version of that is now in court. Um, I see it as a really um, way of, of nullifying voices. When we looked at the, at the plan that they unveiled in late, late December, what we found were that women's voices were nullified, that uh, in Jefferson County, it didn't have to be the way they redistrict, but instead of having four minority majority uh, districts, we have three. Um, we took uh, four incumbent women who were strong advocates on the floor and put them in two districts together. Um, my district uh, changed so drastically that I'm not running for reelection now. 
Uh, and we saw across the state that where women were very vocal, they, their districts changed drastically. So that started us off on a, uh, a, a more of an adversarial, I think, uh, relationship with the majority party. Then we went into, you know, budget. The, the House historically um, released their budget early. Uh, traditionally, what happens is the governor has his um, State of the Commonwealth and budget addresses, and then he uh, releases his, unveils his budget. That House felt it was, they felt that it was necessary for them to go jump ahead of the governor. So we saw a budget leave the House very, very early in the session, uh, and then it set for about two months over in the Senate. Um, and it, it was. Uh, uh, um, there were good things in the budget, but it was a time of missed opportunities. We had more historically, my cat is <laughs> messing up my picture, sorry. Um, we, had, we had the opportunity to, uh, that we not had since I'd been in Frankfurt since it, the late 90s, we had the opportunity to really make bold investments into our state uh, under the leadership of Governor um, Bashir, we had uh, a great economic year. Revenues were up despite the pandemic. Um, and we had billions of dollars that we could have invested in the state. And just like Leader McGarvey said, we could have looked back 20 years and said what great decisions they made. Uh, and we could, we, could have, we could have debated where we could best use those resources. Was it in education? Was it in infrastructure? Could we have made sure that every Kentuckian had clean drinking water? Could we have opened up the state to broadband? But we never had those decisions because they were all made behind closed doors. Lots of other, I think, really unfortunate bills passed. Uh, the governor has vetoed most of them. We will go back in on Wednesday and Thursday and deal with those. Um, but, um, you know, we could have had universal uh, pre-K. Uh, there are a lot of things that we could have done with this boom of money that we had. And um, again, I will echo, it, it was really a missed opportunity of a session. So we heard it again, missed opportunity. But we also heard missed opportunity while a bunch of money was left on the table, uh, unprecedented opportunity that wasn't taking advantage of it. If I summed up what you just said, uh, Leader Jenkins. Senator Reginald Thomas. Senator Reginald Thomas is a caucus leader. Understand what a caucus leader does. It's like he sort of herds cats, so to speak. He sort of keeps uh, the caucus in a framework where it's functioning so that the leadership um, has the caucus in such a framework where we are communicating as a body and sharing information. So Senator Thomas, what's your impression and what struck you most of all about this particular session? Well, Senator Neal, thank you for having me. And, and it's, it's, it's always good to be back with you. Um, I hate to sound like a broken record, uh, but, but I'm going to stay with, with, with my own theme that, that, that my floor leader, Senator McGarvey, um, has mentioned and that uh, 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 House floor leader, Representative Joni Jenkins has reiterated. This was, this was missed opportunities. That you can't put it any better than that. Um, you know, I, I, I'm here to talk about the budget. So, so let me be myself and talk about some of the good things first. I don't want to jump into the negative right away. I think there were some good things about the budget. And I would say, that I think the biggest positive about the budget is that we did put money back into the hands of state workers. Uh, on the area of social workers, for instance, who you know, have been ignored for years, we're giving social workers, first of all, a, ten, a flat $10,000 increase in their salaries, okay? And then on top of that, they're going to get an 8% increase in their salary. So social workers, we're finally recognizing their value and saying, we're going to reward you for that. And we're doing something very interesting with, with social workers uh, that we've never done before. We're basically giving, giving these workers a sabbatical after four years. We're saying after you've worked four years, if you want to uh, go teach school uh, or if you want to pursue those, uh, uh, some other avenue of interest, to you. Uh, you can do that. You can take, you know, take a step back for a year and then come back. And I think that's a good thing really for the workforce in general, but especially for social workers who have to deal with so many heavy issues. We're doing that. We're giving money to Kentucky State Police 
uh, we're, we're giving them a 10% increase in their salary. Uh, and for, for other state workers, we're giving them an 8% increase in their salary in year one, and as much as a 12% increase in their salary in year two, based upon what a, a study is to be formed by the Kentucky Personnel Cabinet as to you know, their, the, the, the benefits of the work they do and how they compare with other workers. So, so, me, so go ahead. Yes. No, no. So what I'm hearing here is that uh, we had some missed opportunities, but some good things happened too. Yeah, yes, I, and, I, and I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to fail to highlight the good opportunities. There, there were some good things we did, and, and rewarding state workers was a, a good thing. Uh, but as been mentioned before, and I know I'm running short of my three minutes, um, so I, I'll just hit this: our failure to adequately fund public education was really a missed opportunity, and we're going to regret that. The fact that that uh, we didn't fund at all universal pre-K. That was proposed by the governor and, that, governor, and that wasn't much. You're only talking about $172 billion a year. And, and, and Senator McGarvey talks about the fact we have $4 billion to spend and we couldn't find, we, we, we couldn't find uh, what, what amounts basically to like uh, uh, more than 2% of that to fund. We had enough money to fund pre, universal pre-K for the next 20 years. And we and we 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 didn't do that. I'll stop here. I don't want to. Well, I, I want you to hold that thought because I want yeah, you. There, to there's more I can talk it. about the budget, but that gives you some of the highlights and 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 again some of the missed opportunities we 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 uh we uh just just, just failed to address in this budget. Well, I, I want you to hold that thought because I want you to come back later on in the discussion and talk about why that pre-K is so important. I've heard that twice now from the House side and the Senate side in the context. Now we have uh, Pamela Stevenson, representative of District 43 in Louisville. Uh, welcome, uh, Representative Stevenson. What was it, just go to your gut, what was it that struck you most of all about the session that we're closing out? It was dismal. Now, we just came out of two years of a pandemic, social injustice, weather, tornadoes, cities destroyed, people destroyed. And we had the unique opportunity to put Kentucky back together better than when we started. And we didn't do that. We let down people that depend upon us to make sure that um, we move from the bottom of all these lists to the top of these lists. And we didn't do that. Instead, what we did was allow people's pet projects and pet desires to take over for the good of the people. Every day, we, when we're in session, we say the Pledge of Allegiance. And right across the banner, it says, in God we trust. And most of the time, we took actions that would interrupt democracy, interrupt in God we trust, interrupt united we stand, divided we fall, interrupt anything good that would make sure that we Kentuckians come out stronger. So it's dismal because we did not take care of the people and we could. And they've been hanging in here with us for years because we didn't have the money. People that don't have good drinking water, they waited for us. People that don't have broadband, they waited for us. People that don't have jobs, they waited for us. And they waited and we have it and we failed. Disney. Well, it seems to me that I'm getting a theme here. <laughs> I'm getting a sense of this, but I got to go to Representative Derek Graham because he's been there for a while. He's seen it. His district encompasses the Capitol. I would like to hear Representative Graham, uh, the caucus leader in the House, uh, Democratic caucus leader, what struck you most of all about this session? You're on mute. My top colleagues touched upon it. You know, I'm an educator, um, taught for 27 years, and we know through studies that if you, you invest in the early years, that kids can perform no matter where they come from with that foundation, they can perform better as they move through the process of going through elementary, high school, and even to college. So we, we missed out on that in, in a certain uh, case of not uh, with pre-K, universal pre-K. But I wanna touch upon something that 
uh, is very near and dear to me and to you and to uh, most of us uh, in the General Assembly, and that's Kentucky State University. And so we had a charge that the university needed $23 million and $18.5 million for the school to be able to get through this year and the following year in terms of helping the university get back on track. And so what we were able to do, instead of the five-year pro, uh, process that they have requested, the General Assembly put it down to three. Uh, with the understanding, I think the language is in there, as the university continues to progress, it can move to 5%. And we can talk about that. Uh, yeah, I want you uh, to get into more depth of that when we get in the conversation. When we talk about that. And then well, the other thing you? that- uh, Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. And Go so ahead. the other thing that I think is probably the most important for all of us is terms of our democratic process. And everyone has talked about it already, the leader in the Senate, leader in the House. But I was one of those ones who decided to take it to court. And we're in the process of that. But I just want to give you an idea as to how bad the congressional districts and our districts are. And I gave this example in, in, when we talked about it. If you start going from Lexington, which is in the sixth congressional district, and then you want to drive over to Louisville, you go through five out of six districts, congressional districts, within an 80 mile uh, radius. And there's only so six. It's only six, and the only area that we're missing is, is Eastern Kentucky. Hmm. But if you come through Frankfort, if you come through Lexington and, and, and Woodford County, you in the sixth district. When you get to Frankfort, you are in the first district. When you get to Shelby County, you are in the fourth district. If you get to Eastern Jefferson County, you are in the um, second district. And if you get to downtown Louisville, then you'll be uh, in the third district. That is ridiculous. That's ridiculous. And so I think that is one of the most important things that we have to address, not only for the congressional districts, but in our house district, which Representative Jenkins just talked about. And so as we move uh, tonight, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to talk about several issues that have been brought up, but I think the bottom line is, and I agree with all of my colleagues, is that we did not take the opportunities of moving Kentucky way ahead than what we've ever been able to do before. And I think in the long run, it will come back and it will, it will hurt us as a Commonwealth. Thank you for that. And now we have uh, Katura, Representative Katura Heron, who represents District 42. Uh, Katura, you, you're an individual that's got significant experience uh, in the legislature uh, before you became a representative. I'm really interested in, in the, how you took this first session. This is your very first one uh, as a representative. How did you read this session? What struck you most of all? Thank you so much, Senator Neal, for hosting and for having me. Um, just for folks to have some context, I was sworn in on February 28th. So my uh, um, involvement in the session was right in the middle, uh, right in the thick of things. And so um, as what, you know, my colleagues have, have spoken very clearly about some things that um, we did not get that we would have liked to see. Um, so I, I don't want to go on there. But what, what I do want to want to say about what struck me is most of my work has been around social services, uh, work around the justice system. And uh, the four committees that I was assigned to this session, the first one is elections and constitution amendments, um, agriculture, license and occupation in local government. And I say that because what I've realized in this short period of time, that there's a lot of important things that happen in those committees. For instance, local government, anything that happens with fire, uh, the fire department, police, public works, planning and zoning, that is going to come out of that committee. Uh, when we're talking about agriculture, we know statewide uh, Black farmers have been left out, that uh, Black folks are really trying to to get their land and start to farm, those things are going to come through those committees. Um, license and occupation, anything that we're talking about, real estate, alcohol and beverage control. And so, so for me, uh, the highlight for me is, was, was getting to know and understand what these other committees do. Uh, the work that I've done before as a, as a policy strategist and a lobbyist was on those social justice issues. And so um, I am excited to continue to, to learn and work. 
Um, but I will say this, there's one bill in particular, House Bill 44, uh, that was passed. Um, and that bill made sure, it makes sure that students are able to take mental health days. And so that was a, um, a piece of legislation that I think that was great. Um, and so I will expand upon that as something that I would like to see uh, some other things further along that, that line around mental health and making sure we have more mental health providers. But I, um, th those are my highlights, things that I'm excited about. Uh, but we do have a lot of work to do and I look forward to doing that with you all. Well, I'm, I'm gonna tell you something, you raised a very critical area there because there were students, more students there actively dealing with the legislature than I can recall. Uh, I saw a lot of activism, a lot of uh, professionalism with these students. I mean, they're very sophisticated in the way they approach that. And you just named one of them, the one uh, that's related to House Bill 44. Look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to switch around a little bit because it's, it's poked its head through all of this discussion we've had so far. And that's this, the budget. The budget is the most important policy statement that we can make. We all know that. It has, it, it reflects our values. It's what we are, it's who we are. And we just framed it inside of a, miss, a series of missed opportunities. What I would ask each of you to do is to think about it. I'm gonna start with Morgan. I want, I want you to think about what was it that was so egregious as it relates to the budget and or where it missed the mark, in other words, shortfall. And then I'm gonna flip it. I want you to say something about and share with our audience what was important that happened that was reflected in the budget. So I'm gonna ask each of you all to go there. So I'm gonna start with Morgan and I'm gonna work my way around this. And I'm gonna ask Reggie to just go to those two, those two points because we're gonna come back later on and I want Reggie to go in depth on the, on the budget. So uh, Morgan, I'm gonna, we're gonna get informal here for a minute if it's okay for everybody. So Morgan, what was the plus uh, who, uh, what was the good and what was the bad and ugly? This is when you don't want to go first because you're thinking about the entire budget and uh, <laughs> picking something out. Um, but no, I, I'll start with the bad. We've talked a lot about how it's a missed opportunity. I don't think we've gotten really into the details of why that is. I'll give you an example why I think it's a missed opportunity. We are spending over a billion dollars in this budget to give a tax break to the wealthiest Kentuckians. You're spending over a billion dollars to give, I should say, a further tax break to the richest and wealthiest Kentuckians. And it will hurt, we talk about not just the poor, this will hurt working middle-class families who are trying to make ends meet. Instead, we could have used that billion dollars to grow our economy. We could have used that billion dollars to educate our kids for workforce development, for putting our entire state forward that would have generated even more revenue that then we could have talked about some of these things. And when I talk about these tax cuts, you remember, since we're being informal, we are, we're informal all the time. We're all, you know, we all know each other and work together on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. Gerald, that tax plan that was introduced was brought into committee at 12.45 p.m., no one had ever seen a copy of it before. No one had ever seen it. By 2.37 p.m., it had been voted off the floor of the Senate. It was a 208-page bill where every word on every line of every page mattered. It was done in the dark. It was done without consultation of even their own members, right? This tax policy needs Democrat voices, Republican voices, urban voices, rural voices, Black voices, white voices. You know, it... it needs input from everybody if we're going to be successful. It didn't there. That is a missed opportunity in the budget. What's a good thing about the budget? And I'll wrap up. Good things about the budget. I was really happy to see us invest in more of our social services, in our social workers, in our state employees. Um, you know, you look at a place like Maryhurst, which does such wonderful, good work in Kentucky. They're paying their employees 11 and $13 an hour when you can make $19 an hour for stocking shelves at Walmart or, or $21 working at UPS, or now I saw $24 an hour working at Target. Um, these are super important jobs taking care of some of our most vulnerable people in the state. We have to be able to compete with the private market uh, to make sure that those functions are, are still in place. Uh, this budget gets us toward that, which I think is a good thing. Thank you for that, Joni. What do you think? What, what was good and what was ugly? 
You on mute. I was trying to outsmart my cat. Um, <laughs> I, th I think, you know, certainly the investment uh, made in our workers. Uh, I was disappointed that we did not mandate raises for our teachers. Uh, there were more spending for education and the Republicans said that local districts would have more money and they could make the decision whether or not they were gonna raise teacher salaries. I thought that was a mistake. I think we should have mandated that, that put the money in the budget for that to happen. I think it's important. Um, I think um, uh, one of the things that I was really interested in because I've done so much work with kids in state care that we increase the daily rate for uh, those facilities that take care of our most vulnerable uh, kids that have so many challenges and, and uh, residential um, uh, facilities have been asking that for that for years. Uh, I want to just kind of uh, piggyback onto what Morgan said about the, the tax um, reform, uh, which was a, a tax break to the wealthiest. I had a conversation with a family member. I do have family members that have money and said uh, to, to my family member, I said, well, I guess you were glad to get that, you know, cut in personal income tax. It would really help you probably. And he said to me, he's like, you know, it's, it, I'd rather see my potholes fixed. I'd rather make sure that, you know, the fire department comes to my house, that the police come to my house if I call them. Yeah, we, we're getting a little bit more money back, but, you know, I'd rather see government take that money and spend it in a way that helps not only us, but everybody. So I think that if we had not done House Bill 8 in the dark of the night and we had let more Kentuckians from all over the economic uh, landscape talk about what they wanted from state government and what they wanted from their taxes, I think we could have come up with a better plan. Reggie, you're on mute, Reggie. Yeah, I, no, I've got it, Gerald. Gerald, I've already talked about what I think the positives are in the budget. So, so in answering your question, you know, I'm going to talk more about what, the missed opportunities and where I think we really fumbled the ball here. Uh, and, and that's in pre-K. You know, I've been a staunch advocate of universal child education since I came uh, to, the, to the legislature. And the reason being, Gerald, we hear, we hear a lot about uh, achievement gaps, and, 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 and that tends to dominate the discussion when we talk about the failings of, of public education. But the reality is that's not a failing of public education. That's just a reflection of our society uh, and the economic diversity that exists within our society. Because you have children, Gerald, and I said this earlier today when I was on, on, on a weekly radio station I have do here in Lexington. You have children that come in kindergarten, Gerald, with a 300-word vocabulary. That, that, that they, they have, just have, a, have a total of 300 words on the first day of kindergarten. And yet in that same class, Gerald, there are students who sit right next to them with a 3,000 word vocabulary. And that's because of, of the, the variety of incomes we have that come to public schools, still parent resources, all of that. So the achievement gap, Gerald, really begins in first grade. And I think it was, was Johnny who made the point, it may have been Morgan, what one of them, maybe both of them, that studies show that your best investment in education, Gerald, but it's not in higher education, it's in early child education. That, that's, that's what your education experts tell you, that if you get children in there early and teach them you know, the alphabet and how to read and how to begin working with numbers, that that's the biggest payoff for you. And those studies show that those children go on, have, first of all, have better health outcomes, uh, uh, are, are more likely to graduate from college, are more likely to have higher income. So the, so it, so the earlier you get them into school, the bigger and better payoff it is for our society. Uh, and I think the worst thing we failed to do when we had the money, we had the money to fund early child education was to not do that. And we're going to pay for that uh, um, uh, you know, down the road. So I think that's the worst missed opportunity. In my so that pre -K, that pre K please piece is, is what I'm hearing, right? Absolutely, there's no question about it. That 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 we re we really failed Kentucky. And since we're talking about education, we really failed Kentucky on this one, and because the price tag isn't that much, and the payoff is is, is enormous. We're only talking about 172 million dollars a year to send four year olds to school. That's all. 
Yeah. And, 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 and I don't want Morgan's point to be missed. Morgan's made this point. I think, I think if we don't listen to it, we're going to miss it. We have $4 billion to spend, $4 billion. Okay. And yet, Gerald, truthfully, we're setting aside $2 million of that for a rainy day fund and for a tax cut to the wealthy. I mean, we're, we're basically saying we're going to get 50% of that money for, for a rainy day fund. We got, we got to fund a rainy day fund. But, but, but we don't have to fund it in record numbers, which is what we're doing. And we sort of have to give the, the, the wealthiest Kentuckys a billion, a, an additional billion dollars. Why do you think they're doing that? Oh, I, I, Why do you I, think I, the I, Republican leadership in the House and Senate have come together to embellish the pockets of the rich and not take advantage of taking care of deficits that we know the most vulnerable in our society are subjected to? Because, but Gerald, regrettably, that's what Republicans in this country do right now. That's what they do. You see it. You see it on the federal level. Hopefully, Morgan will see that. I know Morgan will see that next year, uh, when he when he when he gets elected to Congress. But you see it on the federal level. You see it on. You see it throughout various state legislators, legislatures. Excuse me, legislatures here in this country. That's what Republicans do. So Derek. So Derek. Yes. You raised the question of Kentucky State University. Yes. And you outlined some of the things that had to happen that did happen. Yes. And I want you to go over that briefly, but is it enough? Well, it is not enough if you base it upon, if you go back and look in the 1990s, what Kentucky State was appropriated by the General Assembly what we were able to get was basically money that is at probably at that rate, which is probably less money in terms of spending. But at this point, we focus on what the university said they needed to do. Uh, they're working with CPE. CPE will be working with them over the next three years. Uh, the understanding is within the legislature, if the university is moving forward, then they can be within that five years range. But if you look at the things that Kentucky State is well noted for, they were not funded for. Let's look at the nursing program. It's one of the most successful nursing programs in the state, 100% rate in the last couple of times that the students have taken their um, nursing uh, test. And yet they're in a building that was probably there, Senator Neal, I don't mean to call, call you out from your how old you are. Well, but it was probably that, there. Derek, gonna get you in trouble. <laughs> but it was Go probably ahead. there. I know it was there when I was there, which is almost 50 years ago or 40 years ago. Um, and so they need new facilities. And initially it was in the last budget, previous budget, buying in budget, but then it was cut out, I believe, by the Senate. And so those are the things that prevent the university from moving forward. Uh, to highlight the major areas of the university that do extremely well and well noted across not only the Commonwealth, but across the country, such as our um, um, the um, uh, fishing, the uh, I'm having a moment here, Gerald. Our, um, well, let me, uh, let, me, let, me, let me take you somewhere because I want to frame this piece because uh -huh. I think the listening audience ought to get this. First of all, Kentucky State is underfunded. And has it's been, been underfunded in terms of its been. land grant wait a minute, in terms of its land grant programs since 1890 it's been underfunded it's been underfunded each and every year in terms of the general budget set the land grant aside they did uh, an assessment not recently that showed that over a 20 year period if you go back to the base payment or the base allocation 20 years ago that Kentucky State's only had in excess of that $17 million. $17 million. That's that, exactly right. That is, well, don't let me go there. The, well, the second, and what I was trying to think of was yeah. the aquaculture. The aquaculture program yeah. is one of the best in the country um, and well noted. Um, and what that aquaculture program does, it not only works with the, with, you know, on campus, but it works with farmers to produce those things that can be utilized at the the aquaculture center for those, um, um, you know, the fish that they produce and 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 um, work with, and so the university um, and and the university, the one thing that the university does not have, where the comprehensive schools across the state, 
they are supported by their regional legislators. But Kentucky State is unique because it's centered between the UK and the University of Louisville. And so those two are the biggest institutions as we know, but the focus is not on those central Kentucky areas, which Kentucky State can serve because you have the two, um, compre uh, the two research universities right there in between it. But the university ha uh, has, as you have said, has not really adequately been funded over the years. And we know that, we have the, we have, we have the figures, we see that, we know that. And so, you know, as we move forward, I think the state legislature also has to look at what we have done over the years, not over the last 10 years, not over the last 20 years, but all the way back uh, at the beginning of the university. And so that's something that we need to address as legislators, and we need to remind our colleagues of what they have not done in the past. Well, let's, let's, let's be clear on this. We got to be clear on this. The problems at Kentucky State University were visited upon by the General Assembly's lack of doing what has been right by virtue of that historical, historic yeah. uh, institution. So it's You're a General exactly Assembly right. problem. And Kentucky State, notwithstanding, has actually moved forward exponentially in terms of its retention rates, its graduation, graduation rate, rates, its exactly enrollment right. rates, and yet they try to push this piece on in Kentucky State. They cannot defend their position. Pam Stevens. Let me, let me, in the same framework that we're talking about, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We want some good in here because we're talking about a lot of ugly here uh -huh. and, there's, and there's a lot of bad here. Tell me some good. I know you got some good. Well, I, I, the one thing that I appreciate about the budget is we discovered going through this process that the elderly in our community were on a year-long waiting list for Meals on Wheels. And that was taken care of. If you've lived a whole life and contributed to this community, you shouldn't be hungry at the late hour. That's a good thing. The other thing that that uh, that was good is there were a lot of people who depend on us that are disabled, differently abled, and we put some extra money into the budget so that we can expand our mental health services and our services for those who can't do it by themselves. So those are two good things. Don't ask me for a third. Okay, go to the ugly. <laughs> okay, the ugly is the process. If, if this last year, two years have to tell us anything is, we live in a global world that every country is connected to another country and every state is connected to another state. And we have not taken the actions that we need to take so that our children can compete at the global level. If you look at all the actions we took, our children, first, well, they won't learn what they need to learn soon enough. Then secondly, they'll go out into the world not knowing their history because they won't be taught. And then third, we're depending on them to make the difference, to think their way out of problems that haven't even, be, even been created yet. And we're not teaching them to think. We're not funding teachers, we're not funding schools, we're not funding pre-K. We don't put our money where our mouth is. Gotcha. So Katura, you spoke of House Bill 44 and uh, what was good about that? I know you found something else that's good. I'm looking for good now. I've heard, I've heard so much bad and ugly out of this legislation. I, I'm looking, I'm searching for good. Yeah, I think- something good. Yeah, I think uh, Leader Jenkins uh, took the other thing that I really thought that was good was um, increasing the amount of, of money for our kids um, who are in our foster care or um, our state facilities who are in states care. I think that that's super important uh, to make sure that, you know, those folks who are taking care of our young people um, are getting the things that they need. Um, I will. I know that you said good, good, good. But one thing that I want to lift up as far as missed opportunity is I'm not sure how many folks are aware of this, but in Kentucky, we've had six different juvenile justice uh, commissioners uh, since 2016. And so that has been under uh, both leadership of, of a Republican governor and a Democratic uh, governor. And so what I would have liked to seen in the budget uh, was some funds and money put 
for our young people who are impacted by our juvenile justice system to put money back into communities um, and to, to have some money and funds uh, for overall uh, violence prevention. Um, I think that that is a huge missed opportunity uh, when we talk about a uh, gun violence and overall look at what has happened through the pandemic um, and just life in general, I think that those issues have risen up to the top. And um, I think that there's a, a, a false premises that that is just in um, our urban communities, but it is all across the state. I'm from Richmond, Kentucky and, and, and the amount of violence that we've seen in that community. And so I would have liked to seen uh, some, some funds and money of going to some of those initiatives. So, so I got something good. I got something good. I, I, I've been searching you guys. You're killing me. Look, $2,000 for clerks that work on the judiciary side all over the Commonwealth, plus 8% on top of that as of July the 1st raise. Now, that's good. I don't know if it's enough, but that is good. Would you all agree? All right, family. I found something. Okay. Yeah, so Jerry, I'm, I'm, gonna, yeah. So I'm, I'm coming back to you, Reggie. Here's yeah. what we're going to do now. We're going to all sort of punch in wherever you want to, depending on who's speaking and this issue that comes up. But I want to start with Reginald Thomas because I want him to do a deep dive on the budget and we can play off of that because the budget is probably the most significant document we have. Then perhaps we can get into some of the other bills that are affect things otherwise. But Let's, Reggie, if you'll lead us there. Okay, Joe, let's, let's, let's change the, the uh, topic just slightly. We've talked about the education, the budget. Uh, we, we've talked about uh, issues involving social services, foster care. I wanna spend some time talking about economic development. Um, and, and, and again, I, I wanna talk about it from the standpoint of, of what an opportunity we missed. The, the, the governor had, Alec had proposed $250 million for economic development, to look for new sites for major projects. As all the people in Louisville know, we're, getting, we're, we're in the process now of developing a $5 billion uh, electric truck plant just 45 miles south of Louisville, down 65. You know, that, that, that's going to employ over 5,000 people. You, know, you can't even imagine how many spinoff industries you'll have from that. Uh, supplier industries and, and the jobs that will produce. I mean, that, that's going to really move Kentucky forward in terms of uh, uh, job improvement uh, and our standing as, as one of the top e e electric vehicle uh, manufacturing centers in the world. Okay. So the government said, look, we're running out of sites. We need to find new sites. I want to propose $250 million. The budget that we are sending back to the government, governor now just eliminated that entirely. What, what they replaced that $250 million with $46 million that's parceled out among different counties. Now, there's nothing wrong with giving counties the right to develop their own industrial sites. But the problem is they can't be, build big site of potential you know, with a million dollars here or half million dollars there. Uh, you know, they, they, they may be able to fund some jobs in the area, which is a good thing, but, but given what we've seen here in Kentucky um, and, 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 and what this Ford plant is going to do for us, I mean, we're really, we're, we're really missing the ball here because there are other similar Fortune 500 companies that see what we're doing in Kentucky and say, hey, let me give a look to Kentucky. Let me, let so me tell, look at So tell me how, how have we missed the boat? We, we, well, we, we, well, because the, this, this budget doesn't provide for enough funding to build, to, to, for us to develop big site operations. As I said, it parcels that money out instead, and only 46 million of that, as opposed to 250 million of that among different counties throughout the state. Yeah. Well, let me, let me, let me just say this, that I think you're right about that, but someone else may have an opinion about that, too. The, the governor's, and you have to say this, this governor, despite the environment he's functioning is and has done an extraordinary job. I mean, I don't know any way, other way you can look at it. I mean, think about it for a minute. You have a house that's controlled by the other party of the governor, Republican party, governor's a Democratic governor. 
and a Senate that uh, has a supermajority as well. Yet the governor is in a pivotal position and has brought more economic development to the state through the use of his office. I can't remember a governor's ever done that at the level he's done it. Does, can, does anybody have some research and some information that can well, show well, something well, different here? Well, John, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but, but I have some research. What, what, what Governor Bashir has done since he's been in office is eight, he's provided, he's added 18,000 jobs to Kentucky. The, mm -hmm. the, the, that, that's the highest number we've ever seen in one year by a governor. Uh, so, so uh, in terms of raw numbers, that's the record he has set for Kentucky, and just in his first year of office. Hmm. Anybody else on that? Because I want to switch uh, on to something. I like to, What I'd like to follow up with is the nature in which the House and the Senate Republicans are tying the governor's hands. And I'm not a lawyer. But there is a system of sep separation of powers and checks and balances. And I do think that the legislature has taken too much on itself and taking away the powers, the traditional powers that every governor, regardless if they've been a Republican or Democrat, whether or not some of these um, uh, bills that they have passed are constitutional. So there's several of you here who are, who are lawyers. I'd like to see your take on what you think if the General Assembly has overreached in its powers uh, between them, between us and the governor. Morgan? Yes. <laughs> 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 I mean, and, and I say this, we're all legislators. I'm a legislator. I believe in a strong and independent legislative branch. We are the policymaking body. Uh, we set the policy for the state. We appropriate. That's the fancy word for we spend the money, right? We determine where it goes. But we have to have a strong executive branch to carry out the policies we set, to determine um, how this, you know, if we put however many million dollars or billion dollars into Medicaid, how that's actually given out by the cabinets, how it makes it to the people who need it. We need a strong executive branch to do that. We need a strong executive branch in a time of emergency. The Kentucky General Assembly can only meet um, between January and April and even numbered years and January and March in odd numbered years, right? So when a tornado strikes 250 miles of West Kentucky, it's the governor that administers those funds. It's the governor that puts the emergency management team into response, right? The governor needs to have appointments on these committees and boards. Uh, the governor needs to have that executive power. And you see the legislature trying to take it away. And I think the reason they're trying to take it away right now is because they don't like the governor. governor. You didn't see him do this when Matt Bevin was governor. And arguably they should have if they were going to do it at all. But they didn't. And so I think the I think they've overstepped. I think they're overstepping in other ways too. We just saw the Kentucky General Assembly sneak through in the dark of night a bill that would allow any licensed attorney to carry a gun in the courtroom. And they're not allowing judges to say otherwise. Think of all the the adversarial, sometimes dangerous situations happen in court. Look, people go to court. We've got Colonel Pam on here and, and Gerald. Right? We've got a bunch of lawyers on this call, so I'll stop talking. Um, but I mean, look, you know, a courthouse is where people go because they couldn't resolve a dispute <laughs> between themselves on their own. Right. And we're saying as a General Assembly, judges, you can't decide what happens in your courtroom. What if the judges start ruling how we can dress on the floor of the Senate? Right? I think that's an overreach. I think we're getting into the lane of the executive and the judicial branches and not staying in our own lane where we should be strong, independent policymakers, but leave it at policy. Well, I'll tell you one policy that we instituted some time back and embellished on it. We said everybody can carry a gun. <laughs> they can, it can be hidden. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, there's no rules or regulations. You don't have to be trained on it. Uh, but but uh, as long as you're not a convicted felon, you can carry a gun. If you are uh, what? You got to be 21, Reggie, I guess, to do that. But 
we have a proliferation of guns in our cities and in our rural areas. And yet it seems like we're trying to enhance and increase these numbers for what? Somebody. And Somebody. in one instance yes. on the house floor, we actually had an argument. They presented an argument that a parent had bought a gun to a high school basketball game. And I'm like, well, what did you think they were going to do, given that you said that anybody can have a gun at any time? Where are they going to take it? To a restaurant? Don't be surprised when you get bitten by the rules that are not for the greater good. Yeah. And the other part, I want to piggyback on what Morgan said, is our very existence is depending on the separation of powers, a strong judiciary, a strong legislative branch, a strong executive branch. And when you have a legislative branch that takes all the emergency powers from the governor, the only full-time uh, per, uh, professional, and then you say to that person, you can't use state funds to challenge anything we might have done illegal. You start down this road that erodes the democracy the promise of America and the unintended consequence is the chair will have no legs. So when somebody sets the bottom on it, it's going to fall. You know, one of the one of the uh, questions was raised by one of the listeners at WLOU uh, raised a question. We got kids running around with guns, um, and we've set these policies where people can have it, but kids still aren't don't have the uh, authority, uh, the permission to carry guns, um, even under these laws, but you find a proliferation of guns. This is a problem that's bigger than Kentucky, isn't it? We just pile it in and just going along with the flow, creating more guns on our streets. And these youth, they're ending up in youth's hands and others' hands. How do we stop that, guys? Is there a way? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. It's very interesting that we started talking about um, uh, guns right now. Just recently, I think it was yesterday or the day before, there was something on the news that talked about um, Biden, the Biden administration are looking to um, make these guns called ghost guns illegal. And basically what it is, is that you're able to order these pieces and parts of guns on, off the internet and assembly your own uh, guns. And there's no way to trace them. They don't have any type of serial numbers. And I say that and bring that up because there was a bill passed this session that uh, basically said that if the, uh, the, the presidential um, administration uh, passes any uh, gun bans that we in Kentucky would not um, listen to that or we will not follow, the, follow those laws. And so I can't remember what, what bill number that is, but I think that um, they obviously knew that something was going to be coming down the pipe. Um, and so I do think that we'll see a ban on these ghost guns um, on a national level. But we here in Kentucky um, have just passed legislation that said that we will not follow uh, any type of federal uh, bans on any type of guns. And so we, we have a huge issue. We know that um, guns are getting into the hands of people. Um, you, you talk to some folks and they say they carry guns because they don't feel safe. Um, you have other folks who are carrying guns and are, are committing crimes. And so I think that um, that, that, that obviously that, that's, a, that's an issue that is a near and dear uh, to my heart and that I really want to work on to find solutions. Um, but, but I think that, that one, of, one of the things is that we have to know and understand that the structural racism that specifically has been plaguing our black community is a reason why we're seeing an increase of such uh, a crime and violence in our communities. And so, for example, here in Louisville, uh, we know that um, our community centers have been closed down, libraries have been closed down. When you take away those things from, from young people, they will say, you, say to you, we want to belong to something. And so we have to figure out how to make sure that our communities are having the things that they need so they're not turning uh, to violence and to crime. And so um, it, it is going to be a huge issue to tackle. And I think it's going to take all of us from all disciplines to really think about it. But I think that we also have to think about it from a public health approach. I think that we've been dealing with this from a, a, a criminal legal um, approach. And we know that incarcerate, incarcerating more people does not solve the issues. 
And so um, I look forward to, to working on, on these issues in the future uh, with folks. Let, let me say now, the WOU listening audience uh, is, it was to be with us just for the first hour. We're going to go on another half hour. I want to thank uh, WLOU uh, for simulcasting with us and those individuals for joining us. We will do this again. Applause, applause. Thank you so very much. Now, I think that's a very strong point you just made, but I want to jump on another one because there's a lot of stuff to talk about. Charter schools. Everybody wants charter schools, right? I see people chomping at the bits. Give me a charter school, else my kids will go crazy. Now tell us the real story. Well, Joe, let, let me begin here because, uh, as you as you know, I I, I was uh, quite vociferous in my opposition to charter schools when when we when we dealt with, um, I think it was Senate Bill uh, Senate Bill Six um, uh, 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 in 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 the Senate. Uh, and now House Bill Nine. Yeah, yeah, House Bill, House Bill Nine. Joe, jo, here, here, here's the, the problem with charter schools. I, and, and I I'm gonna try to limit my remarks to three minutes. Number one, in this state, you can have for-profit charter schools. Okay. What that means is that based upon the terms of the contract, the the, the for-profit charter uh uh could be able to retain everything that they purchase in the school, the 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 desk the books, the, the software, uh, and the building. They, they, they can end up owning all of that uh, through the terms of the contract, okay? And so that, that is the biggest ripoff. We, we, talk about, we talk about bad things in this, in, in this discussion. It's siphon off the money. The, the worst thing in the world would be to take public dollars that are TIF education and transfer those public dollars into private ownership. I mean, that's... Sure. I mean, that's just so outrageous. I have to laugh to avoid crime. Okay. Then in addition to that, Gerald, they can cherry pick their students. Okay. If you read the language, they don't have to take free and reduced lunch students. They don't have to take students with disabilities. Now they may be able to take them according to the language, but they don't have to. They can cherry pick their students. You know, they, they talk about this lottery system, but, but when you have a lottery system and it's already rigged, as to who's going to win the lottery, that's not that's not too much of a lottery system, okay. And then on top of that, Joe, if, if it's not bad enough, they are the, the teachers are subject to the same regulations, same reporting requirements, uh, same owners restrictions. You know, uh, Couture talked about teaching history. They 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 aren't limited by by what they can teach in schools, okay. They have the freedom and the flexibility to teach how they want, you know, to whom they want when they want that public school teachers don't have. So I contend when, when, I can, when I can pick my teachers, I can pick my curriculum, I can pick my students and I can own every, everything that, that's in that school, you know, I'm bound to do a, 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 a better job than what your average public school is going to do. So absolutely, yes, Joe, I, I, I think public schools, the way it's designed here in Kentucky, it, 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 it's just opening the, the coffers of public school and saying, for those who want to start charter schools, come in and we'll give you whatever you want and you can keep it for the rest of your life. Hold, hold the, on, the, hold on. Hold, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Derek. Uh, what I was going to say is, uh, if you take that money that you're putting in those charter schools, you can really take that money and invest in pre-K. If you look at what you were talking about in terms of the kind of students, they are going to cherry pick because they want the best and the brightest. But here's what people don't understand. Right now, it's focused on Jefferson County and Northern Kentucky, but that's just to get their foot in the door. If people think eventually down the track, that particularly in Eastern Kentucky and far Western Kentucky, where the community is centered around those, those uh, high schools, Eventually, that's what's going to happen. They're going to, they're not going to stop just in the inner cities or the urban areas. They're going to well, start going into, so going there, into let's, the let's rural make, areas. Let's make sure people understand. In, in this bill, what they did was mandated that Jefferson County and uh, a school in Northern Kentucky have charter schools and that they use their resources uh, to make sure that those schools are, are funded. Exactly. Because remember, when they passed the charter school bill uh, a couple of cycles ago, 
uh, not anybody stepped forward for charter school because there was not a funding stream uh, that they could identify. And they, you know, this whole thing about, you know, dissipating the monies in public schools, we don't have enough anyway. But now what they've done is mandated it. In other words, Jefferson County and some Northern Kentucky school will have to take its funds to promote a charter school that could do all those things that you just said. And in the face of a mixed outcome across the United States of America, the proof and examples of the deficiencies are there. And there are some charter schools that are uniquely situated to be successful and useful, but to do it in the way that they're doing undermines public education. I think that's the argument. It sure does. But, and, but, and, and there's history got, of them. It's history across the river in Ohio where they had to revamp that because yeah, they found exactly. out that the funding that was being appropriated was being misused right. and was not towards uh, the schools per se. So we know that there are problems there with charter schools. Oh, we know okay, that. stop, 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 stop. I found something good. I found something good. I've been looking for you. I found something good. Senate Bill 276, sickle cell disease yeah. uh, legislation, Emily's Law, young lady who had sickle cell disease actually was a, a, a page of mine uh, who succumbed to sickle cell disease. The National Black Caucus of State Legislators, this has been one of the things that's been on their plates for a number of years. They passed this in Tennessee. They called it the Terrence's Law. Now we've passed it in Kentucky. And what's good about it is that now they have to take another look. The Medicaid folks, the human services, they have to have input from folks who deal with this and try to uh, make life better and uh, the research, that whole piece. Now they're gonna have to consider that and make an assessment of expanding uh, the coverage so that we can deal with more people. That's good stuff. But then again, here we go again. CRT, critical race theory, Senate Bill 1, and remember there was Senate Bill 138, there was those two House bills that were just absolutely idiotic. I mean, they were on their face. You knew that this was just a, a contrived attack on, on public education. It was about censorship and other things. And then the Senate <coughs> passed 138, and it wasn't, it was it wasn't as draconian as those two House bills, three House bills actually over there. I mean, just ridiculous bills. And then the Senate bill didn't go anywhere. And then all of a sudden comes Senate bill number one and Senate bill 138 ends up in the language and piggybacks on that bill. And now look where we are. We passed Senate bill one, we got Senate bill 138. It also raises questions about censorship, big brother, mandating what happens in district schools and so forth. What is you all's take on this? Come on, I, I, my head is still spinning from that. Come on, somebody's got some insight on that. Well, it goes against what the Republicans have always talked about. Less government is, is the best government. And yet, in these terms of these two bills, it is government controlling what our social studies teachers and our English teachers because those are the ones that will be dealt with because you talk about many of those issues. Um, the one thing that we want our kids in high school is to be able to eventually to research and establish on their own what we call critical thinking skills and analyzing, learning to analyze. Those are the most the important things in a high school, particularly in middle school too, is when it really starts. But you want kids to be able to research and find and be able to come to conclusions. And it may, it may have different conclusions or different opinions, but that's what you want. You want a student to be able to research and decide for themselves. What they're asking teachers to do is you're gonna be limited to a, a few, um, uh, publishings or speeches that are much more political uh, in nature, which is okay, but they're all institutions. I mean, they're all uh, materials that the kids need to be able to reach out to regardless. You shouldn't, a teacher should not restrain them 
to certain amounts of articles or books. They need to learn and to research on their own because that's what part of teaching is about, teaching kids how to be analytical, how to be critical thinkers. And so you limiting that because some teachers will be afraid to teach subject matters that they have taught over the years now because of that. And then what about education independence? That's the whole purpose of our kids going through public schools. Or if I don't have anything against private schools or parochial schools, my kids went, but we made that decision and we paid for it. The taxpayers should not pay for public, I mean, for private and parochial schools or pay for charter schools which are limited as to who they will take based on what they think will make them look good. So I, it's, it's, it's the educator in me and I've been in education for over 30 years and I see and I know what's going to happen. And I wonder if this bill, the charter school bill per se, once again is constitutional because as you stated earlier, the constitution says we must provide for public education in all communities of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And I am, I, I'm, I'm just waiting for the courts to look at this to see if this piece of legislation is unconstitutional. And I don't, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I, I do think it is unconstitutional. And that goes back to all you lawyers who are on this panel. He's well, not well, a lawyer, hold, hold, but he plays one in the classroom. Well, 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 <laughs> hold, 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 hold on, I, I see right now he's trying to position himself on this lawyer thing, but we're not gonna let him do that. Look, here's here's the deal. I, we got to figure this out. Louisville, for instance, help me now, gives disproportionately its tax dollars back to the general fund. Now think about it. We take a hundred, we, we raise a hundred dollars and we send that hundred dollars to Frankfurt, but we only get maybe $67 back in value out of the general fund. And yet, is there a war on Louisville in the legislature? Somebody explain this to me. Joe, let me, let me, from Lexington, let me weigh in that for you. You give Morgan. them money I, and I, then they I, go I to you, war on you. I, I told you Morgan on? privately. Well, let's, let's look what the legislature did. I'm gonna, I, want, I want you and Morgan to weigh in on this, okay? One, they, they, they told your uh, uh, City council, although I don't know what you what you call your urban your your your, your city metro council, council, your metro council, you know how to operate. They 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 set down rules for your metro council, and then if that was enough, they 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 set down you know how often your school board can meet. I mean that is just unbelievable that that they are now controlling your two major operations of government government. Your, your legislative part of your government and your school board. So I want to hear from you and Morgan. Wait, wait, what wait, you wait. think is about that, that? Is that is that big government again? Is that wait a minute? I, I want to throw it. Be. I, I don't believe what you're telling me. You mean that happened in the legislature, <laughs> and the party in control, which is for small government and decentralized and local government and freedom and all that stuff. I've heard five or six big government moves. No, I know I didn't hear it. Correct. Joe, 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 you can't make this up. You can't make this stuff up what they what, what they did to you little billions. They, want, told you how, they, they tell you how your, your metro council can operate and how often your school board can meet. I want Joni to I, tell I say, I'm throwing it to Yeah, Joni. I want Joni yeah, to tell us Joni about to this the... war on Louisville. <laughs> I want her to tell us what that is all about. Please. She said to fight that fight <laughs> in the house. She's done a hell of a job in doing so. Go ahead, Joni. Well, you know, there, there are three bills that uh, y'all have alluded to that really singled out uh, Metro Louisville. First one is House Bill 314, which 20 years a post merger for us in Louisville, um, the Republican legislature decided that it's time to disrupt merger. Um, I filed a resolution to say, look, we need to decide this at home. We need, and I called on the new mayor elected uh, who will take office in 23 and the new council, half of which will be, or up now, to come together in 23 and really talk about where we are in merger and what is the next steps. Um, but uh, House Bill 314 passed. 
Uh, it looks a little different than it passed from the House, which said that we are going to open up annexation and creating more small cities. We have Morgan, Gerald, 84 small cities now in Metro Louisville. And it seems like the basis of this is Lake Forest, a very affluent area out in the East End, wants to be their own city. And from everything that I can uh, assume from this action is they don't want their money paying for urban service, the urban service district, which is West Louisville. Uh, the Senate even went further and said, everybody can annex except for <laughs> West Louisville which I think is really, really interesting. And lawyers can tell me if that's even uh, would pass muster constitutionally. Senate Bill 1, which we've talked about, um, which added a CRT light bill to it, also added a provision that said how often the Jefferson County School Board can meet. Uh, and then we have House Bill uh, 9, the charter school bill, that says there will be a charter school in West Louisville. Uh, taking all that decision away from our superintendent and our school board. And I think, boy, three strikes are out. There is a war on Louisville. Well, well, a big government war on Louisville, it sounds like. I think you're talking about a couple of things. So there are governmental vetoes. So let's explain how that works. So we have two branches of government, right? Three branches of government. And we pass policy, we pass the laws, and what happens then? Uh, they go over, if the House and the Senate agree, they go where? And remember, the, the people in charge of agreeing of one party, not the party I'm in, if they agree, then it goes to the governor, and the governor can do three things, one of three things. He can either sign the legislation, and it becomes law. He can not sign the, the legislation and it can become law or he can veto the bill. So we have a number of vetoes from this governor which are going to come up in the next two days, the 13th and 14th of April. So somebody tell me that we've been saved by some vetoes from some of these things I've been hearing here. Who wants to go first? Gerald, I'll, I'll jump in real quickly and just say, we talked about legislative power and increasing legislative power. I think this is an example of where the legislature has increased its power and, and potentially to a detriment. Um, when the governor vetoes a bill, all it takes is a simple majority of legislators to override the governor's veto. Right, so if a bill passed, it had a simple majority of votes. Um, that means that basically the governor's veto is not worth as much as it should be. And here's why it's not worth as much as it should be. Legislative districts are what? They are drawn by legislators. Back to the first thing we talked about on this program, redistricting. The redistricting is done in a partisan process. Hey, look, when Democrats were in charge, Democrats engaged in partisan redistricting. Republicans are in charge, they're engaging in partisan redistricting. Because it's partisan, oftentimes these districts don't as accurately reflect everyone in Kentucky. The governor's veto is there to veto legislation and there should be more than a majority override because the governor is elected by the majority of the people in Kentucky, right? And so, I think that a lot of the governor's vetoes will be overridden when we go back in by the majorities in the legislature. Maybe not all of them. I'm hopeful that a couple of them, you know, where the governor has highlighted the exact problems with some of these bills, that the legislature will listen to some of the constitutional arguments, some of the legal arguments, or just notice that the governor caught some of the things that were snuck in there at the last minute. Um, but it will be very difficult, given the makeup of the General Assembly right now, with supermajority Republican caucuses to override, uh, I'm sorry, it will be very difficult to sustain the governor's vetoes with, with supermajority Republicans. So can you think of one bill that might not escape yeah. the veto blade? To, to a bill we've talked about, House Bill 690. I mean, that amendment was snuck in there in the dead of night. Uh, there's no way that bill would have passed unanimously through the House if people had known what was in it, including the Republicans. 
Um, and 690 so, meaning, if you read Sorry, yeah, House Bill 690 was the bill that, that snuck on the amendment, put it on a fair, that's what they do. When they sneak an amendment on, they put it on something non-controversial, right? And yeah. so it was, uh, it was snuck on a non-controversial bill and it allows any licensed attorney to carry a gun in the courthouse for whatever reason, right? Even if you're not there as a lawyer, if you're there getting a divorce, you can now carry a gun as long as you're a licensed attorney, according to the statute, the judge can't do anything about it. Um, I think the governor's pointed out the problems in that bill, and I hope the legislature listens to those problems. We get some real debate on that bill, and that maybe the governor's veto will remain. I know Derek Graham has some concern about lawyers carrying pistols in the courtroom. I've heard his, <laughs> I got his piece on that one. Well, so Pam, Tell me, what is it think, that we should do next? Oh, go ahead, Derek. Go oh, ahead. I was just going to follow up. I think the possibility may exist that some legislators who have gone home and this uh, charter bill uh, that we passed uh, and the governor has uh, vetoed it, I hope the governor is on the phone talking to people from rural areas across Kentucky, particularly eastern and western Kentucky, because if you look at those small communities, the high school is the center of the community. They back their athletics. Um, it is the center of those small communities. And I do think because the vote was very, it was very close, uh, that I would hope that the governor is making those phone calls to Republicans in rural areas um, of Kentucky uh, and put pressure on them as well as superintendents who are in those uh, small communities to call their legislators and ask them to support the governor's veto. I don't know, I'm just saying based on the count that was taken in the house, um, the possibility may be there. I don't know, there may have been some members and we all know the process. We vote one way, but we really wanna vote the other. And so if it looks like it's going to pass, you can vote no. Uh, there may be that instance, I don't know, but I think the governor uh, for public education and to protect our public schools, uh, I would hope that the governor is doing that and uh, talking with members of the house in particular. Pam, lead us out of the wilderness. I know you have the solution to all these problems. Take us there. Well, it certainly is not watching more little women of Atlanta. <laughs> but, but here's the thing, the, all of our rules were set up so that citizens can engage, so citizens can read the bills, so citizens can say, this is how this impacts me. And if you notice, most of what we've done this session, a lot of the bills didn't come in until they were about to be voted on so that the legislators could read them. They waived the rules so they could get it through in one day. We've got to stand up and say no more. Everybody can do something. You might not be able to do everything, but don't disengage. You've got to be willing to say stop. There was a gentleman that was in Iowa uh, and the senator from Iowa's, Iowa was having a hometown, a town hall with his constituents. And this gentleman said to the senator, the U.S. senator, why were you guys so mean to that lady? He was talking about Justice uh, Jackson. And the senator said, yeah, they were pretty mean, but I didn't do that. He said, sir, you were there for, you've been there for 30 years. You could have stopped it. You can stop it. Hold your elected officials to account so that when you pass on this community to the next generation, there's something to pass on. Well, I'm so glad you raised that piece. Katanji Jackson, the new, newly confirmed Supreme Court of Social Justice. I mean, outstanding. Katura, what do you think about that? I mean, it's huge. It's amazing. Um, you know, I, I'm, I am glad that we can now say that there will not have to be another first when it comes um, to um, a Black woman serving on the Supreme Court. Um, but I mean, it, to be able to, to live at this time, to witness it, to see it on TV, 
Um, I mean, it, it's something that we will be able to talk about uh, for, for years and decades. And so um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great feeling, um, but, you know, we still have more work to do. And, and you know, as um, Colonel Stevenson said, you know, I, I just encourage folks uh, to get engaged in your community, um, that, that we as legislators, we as elected officials, we cannot do this by ourselves. And um, it is up to you all to be engaged in the process um, and to also, um, if someone is not doing what they said that they were going to do, is to find someone else and, and, and take their seat and vote them out. And so it, this is going to have to take a collaborative effort uh, to make change here um, in, in Kentucky. Um, but um, Judge Katanji Brown uh, gives me hope uh, to continue to do this work. And it is an honor uh, to be able to serve uh, with you fine folks. Representative Graham. 30, 30 seconds. Can I just add one thing? Go ahead. Kentucky was the first in something. Kentucky was the first state to make the last day of February, the day connecting Black History Month with Women's History Month, a day to honor Black women. And you did a resolution on that. And we did a resolution on it. All right. And it, we're the first state. We're setting the, uh, the way. So I'm very happy about that. And the way you honor Black women is to honor the women in your life. So everybody's included. Well, I've done a wonderful job. Ask my wife. No, don't ask. Uh, <laughs> Representative Graham, take us there. Where do we have to go from here? You're on mute. I think that what we have to do is try to find common ground. And what people don't understand is that we all have almost the same needs and the same wants. We may be in different uh, socioeconomic positions, but I do think most people are good people and most people wanna do the right thing. And if we can get beyond color and just look at us, each other as human beings, I think we, could, we can make this happen. And I think we have shown that it can happen in the 1960s, people who were opposed to uh, integration eventually changed their minds because of what they saw from the press, which leads me to this. I'm very concerned about the press uh, core and what they report on what we're doing. When I first arrived there, there were the press from all over the Commonwealth, from far west to far east, as well as the major newspapers. And now, even with, with here in Franklin County, the state journal doesn't cover us every day anymore. Well, there's and so I think that keeps information from people, from that disseminating of information, that's what helps a, a democracy to be strong, is a press that provides the information to the people. And the last thing I want to say to this, state employees, retirees, have not had a cost of living increase in 11 years. So all those people who are working for us now were trained by those retirees who are now making the same thing in their retirement system, in the retirement system, what they were making 11 years ago. That time is short. That is, this, that is not right. That is not right. And it's not what we're supposed to do as legislators or as people. Senator Thomas, where do we go from here? Well, Joe, I think it's been said, uh, been said quite uh, eloquently. There are two things I got to do, and I can say those quickly. First of all, I'm going to give a shout out one more time to Representative Joni Jenkins, the, the House floor leader. Joni, I want to tell you that since I've got, even before I came to the legislature, but since I've been there, uh, you have been a legislator's legislator. Uh, you, you have done immense work in your role as a legislature, and I've had the highest respect for you. And, and and um, you know, I'm going to miss you, uh, and that uh, you know it ain't I, going nowhere. <laughs> and, and I think somewhere, somehow, uh, we ought to give a tribute to the work that you've done as a legislature. And then also to Katura, the youngest member here. Uh, I've known Katura for a long time. Katura, I want to tell you that I look forward to serving with you as a colleague of mine in the General Assembly in 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 the uh, in the upcoming future. Welcome on, welcome aboard. Representative Joni Jenkins, where do we go from here? Well, I got to tell you, it's been an honor 
to lead this caucus. I have been so proud of the House Democratic Caucus as well as the Senate Democratic Caucus. We are in super duper minorities and every caucus member punches above their weight every single day. They fight back, they fight for working people, they fight for kids, they, they fight for uh, everybody who is in the shadows in our society. I'm quoting uh, Hubert Humphrey a little bit there, um, but I could not be more proud of them. We need to add to those numbers. We need to, in this next election cycle, look very, very um, hard at who's representing Kentucky. And if you're in an area that doesn't have a Democratic state rep or state senator, you need to get out and, and work because this caucus and the, the Senate caucus are working every day to do what's right for Kentucky. And it's hard work, but they're up for the battle. I could not be more proud of my members. I told you she wasn't going anywhere. Didn't I tell you all that? <laughs> and that's a blessing. Senator McGarvey, you have the last word. No, I, I, I just want to uh, piggyback on everything everybody else has said. And, and what my dear friend, mentor, colleague, partner in crime, sister in arms, Joni Jenkins said, we don't give up. We move forward. We do not give up because the working people of this state, people who are working to put food on their plates to make a better lives for themselves, to get a good education, to see a better planet, job, world for their kids and they see today, they're depending on us to make sure that the policies are in place to make that happen. And what we do is whether you live um, you know, on a rural road or a city street, right? We come together, we don't give up. And we carry forward a positive message of hope that our government in this country, in this state, is a government that can do things to help people if we have the people in place willing to do the work. Well, there you have it. There you have it. I want to thank my guests. You've heard it fresh. You've heard it raw. You've heard the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we're talking only about the 2022 legislative wrap-up. So I want to thank my guests, Senator Morgan McGarvey, Senate Democratic floor leader, Senator uh, Representative Joni Jenkins, House Democratic floor leader, Senator Reginald Thomas, Senate Democratic caucus leader, Representative Derek Graham, Der Derek Graham, House Democratic caucus leader, Representative Pamela Stevenson, District 43, and Representative Katura Heron, District 42. I'm Senator Gerald Neal. Thank you for being with us. And now, my good friend and our real leader, Alan Benson. Thank you, Senator Neal. On behalf of the African American Initiative, uh, we would like to thank you for tuning in to this very engaging conversation. Now, to see our current and past AAI summits and conversations, please go to our Facebook page, our YouTube page. Again, thank you and be safe.